to Peter Gorkin, my old friend. I know, it has taken far too long for me to write to you. I had to survive, of course, and part of that meant going dark for a while. But if I'm to be honest, Peter, a larger part of the delay has been because of my apprehensiveness over what I'm going to say to you next. I betrayed your trust. And I'm so sorry, Peter. You've been good to me over the years, a source of friendship and kindness in a world where these qualities have become rare. I know you've always had romantic feelings for me. I should also apologize for taking advantage of those feelings. It was wrong of me to do. At first, I thought it flattering. Later, I accepted those feelings as part of our friendship. I didn't want to do anything that might make me lose you. But ultimately, I did leverage the desire you gave for me to get information I needed. Everything you told me about the Tremere, I gave to Madame Phil, the Nosferatu of the Camarilla, who runs a kind of underworld syndicate of canines within the sect. I didn't do it to save someone or advance some noble cause. I did it so I could have Amelia. I did it to manipulate her, to leave her lover and come back to me. I knew it was selfish when I did it. I just didn't care. I thought the dominoes would fall as I expected, nobody would be hurt who didn't deserve it, and no one would be the wiser. <laughs> We've seen how that's turned out. I had a lot of time to think after the Sabbat Inquisition came for me. It was a brutal battle, and I would have died if not for your Semite mercenaries. I killed one of the Night Inquisitors, a gangrel, I think, when they found my haven, but was severely injured by the rest of the pack and barely escaped the shadows. What followed was a game of cat and mouse. I needed time to recover from my wounds before I could engage them again, and without the Semite, I am sure they would have found me. Their ability to disguise and obfuscate gave me the time I needed to find refuge and blood. After that, it was a matter of hit and run, and I was able to kill another member of the sword, this time a Samichi fanatic who drifted too far from his pack. I told you, I would have fought them until there were no more shovel heads to kill, or I would die myself. But then, I got the letter. Amelia is in danger, Peter, and it's all because of me. I left Prague despite my pride to make things right, to find her and keep her safe. I'm in Munich right now, looking for a way to get myself to London, and with the thrill of being hunted, fading into the drudgery of research, I've had a lot of time to think. You saved my life. And time and time again, you've been there for me when I have needed you most. You've never let me down, and I've always been able to trust you. I know that you trusted me too, and I abuse that trust. I know I'm jumping from a frying pan of a sabbat hunt into the fire of an all-out global war, and I know this isn't fair to you either, but my conscience demands that I confess how I've wronged you, because it haunts me. If these are my final nights, I'd rather meet them with no regrets. If I make it through this, I hope that we might meet and that I may have a chance to make everything up to you somehow. But if I don't make it, know that I've wondered if there is a world for us. I've wanted to love you, Peter, the same way that you love me, and in another life, I think we could have been incredible together. You love me despite my flaws, and I respect and care about you so much. And I know that if I had met you first, I would have fallen in love with you too. But my heart has always belonged to Amelia. I know it's a difficult thing to accept, but in time, I know you will understand. And if I don't get a chance to make it up to you, maybe I can offer some small token in the meantime. Well, in Munich, I've actually found an interesting tidbit of information from a Tremere I've been charming to get me to the coast of France. He likes to talk, and I'm a great listener. And the topic of betrayal being so fresh in my mind, I couldn't resist the irony. You've always had a fascination with the Tremere and an interest in the workings of their elite. My Balkavian friend, do I have something juicy for you? How 
much do you know about Goratrix the Betrayer? His history starts long before his life as a vampire, and his actions would forever change the course of Knight history. Goratrix was a man as ambitious, talented, and reckless as they come. According to the Tremere Magister I'm working on, Goratrix and Tremere were sorcerers long before they became kindred. Tremere himself plucked him from certain death at the stake in Piat to France, sometime before the first millennium AD. Tremere himself was a powerful sorcerer and founded a magical order known as House Tremere. Obviously, a subtle and humble title for a group of wizards. Gortrix didn't just prove himself to be a determined and talented mage, he also stole Tremere's heart and became his lover. The romance begun so long ago would carry with it profound consequences, many of which are still playing out this very night. I wonder if it was this romantic tie between Tremere and Goratrix while they were still mortal that creates such a powerful echo through the centuries. Could it be that love affairs consummated while mortal hold a flush of color that our undead trysts may lack? If so, maybe such things are curses rather than blessings. But alas, even love has its complications. Goratrix found a rival in Etrius, a pupil, and adopted child of Tremere himself. Etrius had been found by Tremere in the slave markets of Constantinople. The great sorcerer and founder of House Tremere recognized potent magical ability in the young slave and bought him and freed him, introducing him to the mysteries of his strange order. Etrius adored his new master, thankful for the life of power and comfort he had been brought into, thinking of Tremere as a father figure. When meeting Gortrix, he immediately despised him. The young mage recognized that Gortrix was competing for Tremere's affection, and a great rivalry was born. But here's the strange thing, Peter. This rivalry represented many leaps forward in the Tremere's power, as the two sought to outdo each other in their achievements. Though at times they also resulted in disaster, and perhaps such competition was Tremere's intention in the first place. In the spirit of that rivalry, one of them would make a big move. In the autumn equinox of 980 AD, Gortrix headed a ritual to establish a fortress at Sioris as the prime chantry for the Tremere Order, harnessing the innate magical properties of Transylvania's soil. Seven mages were escorted by dozens of servants to the mountains of central Transylvania in order to enact the ritual that would give birth to the mighty chantry of Sioris. Among them were some of the most important figures in the history of vampires who would become the Tremere. Tremere himself, Gortrix, of course, Etrius, and Merlinda walked up the mountain that fateful day. The ritual began in earnest at sunset. Now, Peter, brace yourself for the juicy part. As the last rays of light drained from the sky, Gortrix grabbed a sickle and sawed off his own manhood as a sacrifice to consecrate the earth. The blood gushed like a fountain and splattered the other participants, but none of them flinched, for they knew that any outburst, any failure to maintain the chant would be fatal to the magic. Gortrix steeled himself and tore what was left of his intimate parts and placed it upon the desired spot. One of the mages in attendance was unable to control himself and fell to his knees, vomiting his guts out. With a nod from Tremere, Gortrix stepped forward and slit the mage's throat with the same blade he'd used to maim himself. After removing the offending warlock's head, they completed the ritual. But the minor disruption left a crack in the magics of Sioris that would aid in its undoing. It is thought by many in the Tremere that Etrius had some hand in making the unfortunate mage ill, knowing it would harm Gortrix's effort. But these are unverified rumors. As lords of Sioris, Gortrix and Etrius vied even more fiercely for their master's favor. Etrius began to invest more time and resources into the Vienna Chantry, building it as a possible alternative to Gortrix's achievement at Sioris. When Etrius discovered that magic was fading, the two frantically sought ways to preserve their immortality. Meanwhile, Gortrix's ambition would tolerate no other new rivals. And when Micah Vykos, a young prodigy, joined the Order, he couldn't help but feel the sting of jealousy. Gortrix knew better than most how Tremere's attention could wander in the favor of new, incredible magical talent. 
The Tremere had been in a long blood feud with their vampiric neighbors, who they referred to as the Children of the Night. The sorcerers didn't know it yet, but these vampires they were in conflict with were the Savici. Gortrix set up Micah to be ambushed and one assumes killed by the Samichi seeking to eradicate those outsiders from their lands. His attempt to betray Micah to the Zamichi Knights, however, backfired spectacularly, leaving the youth in the hands of the fiends. And of course, Micah Vikos would become Sasha Vikos, an existential threat not only to Clan Tremere, but the Camarilla itself. It is a perfect example of the personal relationship between Gortrix and Tremere having profound consequences on the modern night. But while his plan for murdering Vikos didn't work out as intended, Gortrix didn't let his investigations into the Simichi go to waste. He was plagued by the same mission Etrius was, finding a solution to the weakening of magic, leading to the end of immortality. And vampires seemed like a workable solution to the problem. He would begin to have nearby Zemichi abducted, where he would subject them to terrible suffering through experimentation and vivisection. Eventually, the ambitious mage believed he found a solution. Goratrix crafted the ritual of usurpation. In 1022, following the torture and dissection of a child of the Samichi, Voivode. In the act that would forever earn Clan Tremere the hatred of Clan Samichi, Gortrix's intent was to steal the immortality of Knights while leaving behind the flaws that come with vampirism, such as the need for blood, weakness against the sun, or the beast. As Tremere and the other six leaders engaged in the ritual, they would wake in the aftermath with mixed results. They had achieved the immortality they desired, but in doing so had lost their magic, and what's more, were now vampires. Some of the newly made Knights were enraged. Gortrix was quick-witted. He was quite the silver-tongued devil, convincing the house leadership to adopt and spread the ritual, conveniently omitting a few pesky side effects, of course, so as to avoid any rejection of the change. Gortrix and Etrius would work hard to develop the Tremere Pass of Thaumaturgy during this time, and it wouldn't come soon enough. The Samichi managed to create an alliance of neighboring clans dedicated to destroying the Tremere. This conflict, called the Omen War, nearly led to the destruction of the new vampire usurpers. But Gortrix wasn't the type of Knight to let overwhelming odds dissuade him. During the Omen War, the nasty creature Gortrix helped create the first gargoyles in 1121, made from the combined parts of Gangrel, Samichi, and who knows what else, taken from prisoners that Tremere had captured. He unleashed them upon the attacking Simichi. Ever the innovator, he was also the first to dabble in the newly devised thaumaturgy and led numerous research projects, including a rather intriguing, albeit abandoned, venture into manufacturing Vitae. Fate, my darling Peter, has a twisted sense of humor. Following the Omen War, Tremere would launch a campaign to destroy the Salubri, who are rumored to be rather foul infernalists. While on this campaign, he was somehow manipulated into sending Goratrix to France instead of Merlinda by Etrius, Goratrix's hated rival. Furious, Goratrix left Sioris in 1133 only to discover that the complex politics of Paris suited him far better than the confines of the Tremere Fortress in Transylvania. He also plotted against Etrius, who succeeded him as Lord of Sioris. He also became entangled with the French nobility and found himself at odds with the Knights of the Temple of Solomon. Gortrix's schemes eventually paid off, and in 1307, he managed to persuade Philip the Fair to arrest the Templars in France. However, this upset the careful balance of the power of France at the time. Tremere realized his mistake in sending Gortrix to France and deduced that he had been manipulated. He summoned Gortrix back to Sioris for punishment, but our dear betrayer panicked and fled, abandoning his clan. His ever-growing ambition led Gortrix to defect to the Sabbat in the 18th century, where he formed House Gortrix, commonly known as the Tremere Anti-Tribu. He established his personal chantry in Mexico City, a safe distance from his former clan. House Gortrix, initially a cult-like conspiracy during the Dark Ages, became the backbone of the Tremere Anti-Tribu when Goratrix and his followers joined the Sabbat. 
Rumor has it that House Gortrix is a mockery of the pyramid of the Tremere clan, which Gortrix himself helped co-found. Like all Tremere anti-tribu, they are met with suspicion and, at times, outright hatred. They share the curse of the Tremere clan and often study dark thaumaturgy, though some believe this to be a cleverly spread rumor to explain their survival against countless odds. House Gortrix's organization is more formal, echoing the sorcerer structure of the original clan. Gortrix sits at the top, supposedly ruling all Tremere anti-tribu, though the Americans are far too independent to truly submit. Below him, a council of six, a number chosen to satirize numerology believers, and beneath them, a Jesuit-like hierarchy of obedience to sire and pack. Oftentimes, especially in the New World, the Tremere anti-tribu of House Gortrix will build their laboratories and torture chambers into Sabbat temples, where research victims will not be wasted when they can serve as vessels for sacrifice in the Sabbat ritual. In the modern night, despite all that has come between them, it is still said that Gortrix holds love for Tremere. Little is heard of Tremere, the founder of the clan in these modern nights. One does wonder, though, does he love him back? I want you to know that I love you, Peter. I will forever treasure your friendship and our past together, even if you would wish to never see me again. I hope in time you can forgive me all of my sins and that we might once again wander the banks of the Danube, exchanging stories and gossip about the mad follies of canines. Hopefully, one day you might meet Amelia and gain some understanding of my affections for her. Until then, I remain your friend now and forever. I promise I will make this up to you if I'm able. Love, Melanthia, Clan La Sombra, Munich, January 1945.